hear me? Yes. Can you hear me at the back? Yes. Is that good? Great, thank you. So hi, um, it's still morning, 10 minutes to noon, so still good morning. And uh, welcome to Singapore for our visitors and uh, welcome to the talk. I'm going to talk about uh, me and Shipping. We are going to talk about Ruby and robots today. So can I begin? It's OK? So let me start by talking a little bit about myself. Um, I work for a company called PayPal. Uh, we do payments. Before this, I used to work for HP, uh, doing some research for HP Labs. I also work for Yahoo. And of course, obviously, the, the reason why I'm here today is because I love Ruby. Uh, I've been doing Ruby about 10 years now. So did some recollection. I think I started off in 2005. And just so quick, it's just 10 years from now. Uh, I like Ruby so much that I've actually written a few books on Ruby. And uh, my last book was actually not exactly about Ruby, but it was close enough. But uh, it was translated into multiple languages. So that was pretty cool. Um, so I spoke in this conference since 2011, the first conference, uh, together with Mars. So I'm glad to be here again. Uh, I mean, I've been speaking in 2012, 2013. I skipped last year, and I'm back this year. But I'm back, and I brought a, a friend with me. So let me introduce Shippung. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hi there, I'm Shippung. Um, I'm a software engineer at PayPal as well, uh, and I uh, did my internship at uh, Intel before. And here are some open source projects I've been working on. Uh, this is uh, MiniQ. It is uh, open source quadcopter I designed. Uh, and here is Jack Duno. Uh, it, is, it is a device that you can plug into your uh, mobile phone that uh, do data transmission from your audio jack. Uh, and here is Cashew. Uh, it is a uh, 3D sketching software. OK. Sorry, it's a bit awkward that we have switched back and forth. So let me tell you a little bit about um, how we came up with the idea. In two years ago, two years ago, uh, Jim Werig was here. And he spoke exactly on this stage. Uh, I think it's two weeks exactly will be exactly two years. As before, the night before we had the uh, um, conference, we had speaker's dinner. And uh, I sat next to Jim during the speaker's dinner. And we chatted about many different things. And one of the things that he showed me, and something I want to show you now, is this. You can't really hear it, and it's a bit slow. But uh, when I first saw this, it sort of totally blew me away. It was like, wow, you can actually do that. Uh, and of course, light bulb started to flash in my mind and said, look, I got to do this. And I wanted to try it. So last year, I wanted to try something like this. But of course, um, I couldn't make it last year. And at the beginning of this year, I was thinking, what should I do for uh, RubyConf this year, RubyConf this year? And then I thought, hey, you know, this is what I saw two years ago with Jim. Uh, while Jim is no longer with us, I want to continue the spirit and talk about hardware. Uh, and talk about robots, and this is how we arrive to this talk, and this is why I'm here today. Okay, so um, in this talk, I'm actually going to just go through the journey about how um, we came out with the robot, how we've actually developed the robot. And unlike, um, I think I've seen some robot talks, and I think some people talk to me about, hey, you're not going to talk about robots, and uh, you're not going to actually do a lot of stuff. And so true enough, I'm actually not going to do a lot of stuff. Uh, but I'm going to show you how we actually went from almost nothing to actually building the robot and actually um, running it, right? <coughs> making it work using Ruby. So let me start off with the hardware. When, we came first, when I first came up with the idea about doing a robot, um, I didn't actually want to do a drone, because Jim did a drone. And uh, I know Shu Peng was actually good in drones. Right? You saw his open source project. But I wanted to do something slightly different. So we went scouring around the internet to see you know, what could we do. And um, lo and behold, I saw on eBay right, something like, hey, this looks cool. What can I do with this? So as it turns out, this is actually 
uh, robot frame called Torobot. It's by a Chinese uh, hardware company that specializes in building uh, robot frames. So that was pretty nice, and it's not that expensive as well, so I wanted to give it a try. Um, as we dug a little bit deeper, I saw that actually it was a clone of uh, an, another robot company called Lynx Motion. Uh, so the specific model is called Lynx Motion Phoenix. Of course, um, the Phoenix was actually a little bit more expensive than the Torobot. So the Torobot is about 173, and the uh, Phoenix was close to $800. Uh, this means that this is the, the body as well as the servos. The servos are basically the motors that runs the, the robots. Uh, it has no electronics, of course, but that could come later. So I guess there's no question on which one we should actually go for, right? So, uh, so we bought the Torobot frame, and then we went shopping. Right? Uh, and we went shopping on all kinds of places. We went to Duo Extreme, we went to Q10, which is a local uh, uh, company here, eBay, RS Online, selling electronics. And we bought a lot of stuff. So instead of the, uh, the ones that came with the Phoenix, we bought the uh, Tower Pro MG 995. MG here is the Metal Gear servo. Uh, we bought 18 of them because it needs 18 servos to power the, uh, the, the, the Hexapod, which is the robot you saw just now. It's pretty cheap here, $6, whereas the other ones that we bought from Lynx will be about $40 each. So we got this. Um, Pretty nice and popular servo. To power it, we got the 32-channel servo controller, again from Torobot. It's reasonable, pretty price. Um, the servo controller has power for the servo controller itself. So it actually requires two kinds of power. Uh, one kind of power for the controller and another, type, uh, another power for the servo. So it needs two uh, power sources. Then that's the input and output for the controller. And of course, that's the jacks for the servos themselves. So to power the servo controller, um, I got a, so occasionally we shop, you get freemiums, right? So this is one of the freebies I got. Uh, so this powers the servo controller. To power the servos themselves, um, got a battery pack of uh, four AA size alkaline batteries. Uh, this costs about $2. It's, about a dollar for the pack itself, and uh, two dollars, two Singapore dollars uh, in Daiso. We got the, uh, the alkaline batteries, so this comes about two dollars. We thought, okay, that's 1,500 milliamps per hour. Is it enough? Maybe not enough, but it's, hey, it's just two bucks, so let's get three of them, right? So we got three of them. Uh, 450, like, that should be pretty good. So let's start building the the legs now. Um, each leg actually has three degrees of freedom, uh, which means really three servos per leg. And we model it, well, this is actually modeled uh, against the legs of an insect, which has the coxa, the femur, and the tibia. So we model it against the, the insect leg. Of, and this is how we actually built the legs with the coxa and the femur servos. Then this is the actual femur. And this is the, the tibia. So we built all these things separately, then we put them together. So this is the uh, coxa, femur, and tibia. So that's one leg. You see each of these legs uh, has a servo with the uh, wires coming out. So it sticks out. The red and black is for the power and the ground. And the orange is a signal cable that goes in. And this is how the leg and the servo controller work together. We, have the wire sticking into the server controller. So now we got the mechanical part of it. We have the legs, we have the controller able to control the, uh, the legs. We need the brains. So what kind of brains do we use? We use the Raspberry Pi, right? So at that point in time, the Raspberry Pi came out with version two and said, hey, that's perfect. So we got one uh, and we attached the Raspberry Pi to the server controller using their GPIO uh, output so how do we control the, how do we control the Raspberry Pi? How do we actually communicate the Raspberry Pi? Uh, we use the USB Wi-Fi adapter and stuck it on the Raspberry Pi. So this is how it works now. So we have the Raspberry Pi, we have the servo controller, and we have the legs. We have everything now, so we put it together. And more pictures, you can see like resembling the, the robot. And finally, we have it. It's a little bit messy, but hey, that's not too bad. It's fully assembled hexapod 
version one. And here you go. Let me just show you a quick video of it. It's coming, it's coming, coming. There you go. It, it moves. That's good. <laughs> Next, we wanted to make it move more, right? So it should move more. So it needs to move. It, otherwise, it can't be a robot. So let's make it move. Okay. Sort of moving, <laughs> but it's not really going anywhere, right? So, okay. What's wrong? Um, it's basically there's not enough power. Like, so we went back, we poured through the specifications and say, hey, what's wrong? Uh, we look at the servos themselves, it's 400 milliamps when there's no load and one to two amps when there's under normal load. So we have 12 servos that powers the leg when it's standing up um, and six servos that are just not doing anything when it's standing up. Uh, that comes out to be about 21 amps. And the power required for that uh, to drive it is 126 watts, right? Um, let's look at what we actually need, what we actually have in the double uh, A battery pa packs. So we have each one of them. Uh, we tested the current and the voltage. So we got about seven watts per pack. So we have 21 watts. So of course it wouldn't work, right? So yeah, <laughs> screwed up. Okay, that's what it is. So we went ahead and, and bought another battery. Uh, we went less cheapo this time around, right? So that was two bucks each. So we bought this LiPo uh, battery. LiPo is a lithium polymer uh, battery. This is actually used to power radio controlled helicopters. We bought this about $20. Over. That's pretty okay, not too expensive. Uh, and we calculated, we did our calculations again 160 uh, milliamps hours times 20C. It's 32 amps. And the power we get is 237 watts. So that's a lot more than 126 watts, so yep, it should work. So great, let's get it moving. So we did some fancy soldering. Um, this is actually me. Uh, I have not soldered for 22 years, right? so that was my first attempt. It actually failed miserably, so I got Shippung to help me to solder after that. So, um, and then we went ahead, and it blew up. Right? So what happened was. I connected it, there was a sizzle, there's a snap, and then smoke started rising from the uh, servos. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, I made a, a really, really terrible mistake. So I thought it was 7.4 amps, uh, 7.4 volts, because it says 7.4 volts. Of course, I did not RTFM, because the next line says, actually, it is not two cells, it's a three cell battery, so it's 11.1 .1 volts. And 11.1 volts is definitely a lot more than the 7.2 max operating range of the servo. I thought 7.4, a little bit more than 7.2, it should be okay, but it's actually a lot more. So, um, yeah, smoke came out, the whole thing burned, and I lost eight servos. Right? It's just totally demolished. Right, uh, <laughs> screw up, that's a rookie mistake. Right? So, went back again did more research and we found a voltage regulator. So what a voltage regulator does is it converts a, um, a power source of uh, high voltage and convert it into a low voltage. Uh, we did some more fancy soldering, so I uh, did some stuff and then went ahead. So what else could go wrong, right? So uh, as it turns out, the Raspberry Pi that we got either is because it's just too many tries or it's just lazy handling or I did not put in whatever it is, hardware breaks and that was unstable. We could not communicate with the Raspberry Pi. It um, killed the SD card we put in. Whatever it is, it just did not work. Yeah, so yeah, that, was, that was really terrible. Um, but we persisted and thought of a different way of communicating with the, the robot now. So instead of putting the Raspberry Pi, the brain, directly on the robot, so what if we actually put the brain somewhere else and communicate with the robot remotely. So uh, we bought the JY MCU Bluetooth adapter and stuck it to the servo controller instead of having it uh, into the Raspberry Pi. And then we sent signals from the computer through Bluetooth into the servo controller. Right? And then here we go. Let's see how that works. This, this is it. 
Stands up. Good. And <laughs> hey, it starts moving. <laughs> so flush with this success, what we did was uh, we went ahead and did some tweaking. Uh, it was actually quite noisy. I, I did not have the sound here, but you know, it was like hard metal hitting the um, floor. It made a huge sound. Like it woke up all the neighbors and everything. So padded feet. So I plug out some uh, rubber padding from your pants and then stuck it as the legs. Um, use some cardboard and build a case. And then we have the version three. That's the version tree stretching his legs. That's the version tree ready to go. And uh, here you go. All right, standing up. And then slowly strutting his way towards me. Slowly, slowly. And no, oh, it's moves. It's pretty good. It's not too bad. It didn't make a ruckus. It didn't wake up the, the neighbors. Uh, my wife wasn't complaining, uh, which was good. Then. So it's hello world robot, so, and it works. So that was the hardware. So how do we actually control the software? So let, let's see how that works. Um, so as I said earlier on, we actually use a computer to send the signals through Bluetooth to the, the legs. But how does it actually do it? Um, we send it through serial, and we send text commands, really. So the text commands have things like this. So uh, hash one, one is a servo channel. So it has a 32 channel, so a servo channel means that the first a channel it sends to. Um, how much to rotate the servo? So a servo is basically a, a, a motor that can only move to a certain degree given the particular signal it sends. Here is 100, uh, 1,500, uh, uh, whatever it is, and there's a rotation between 500 to 2,500. Uh, and then the command after T is the speed from 100 to 9,999. So that's controlling one servo. Uh, to control three servos, basically you just string them together. And you can string as many as you want to the servo controller. And the servo controller would then trigger off the, the legs. It's not that complicated. So this here is servo one, servo two, servo three. Now that's pretty simple enough. So to make it even simpler, right, uh, build something called bots. Simple library for controlling robots. Uh, and it's, it's pretty simple, I'll show it to you later. Uh, so time for some Ruby code. So basically, we just model the servo, uh, initializing it with a number, which is a servo channel. And then we do a rotation. The rotation does nothing else but return a string that indicates like the, the number, the servo, and uh, how much rotation it should actually do, given the degrees. And then we model a leg as well. So each leg is a three degree of freedom leg, initializing with the coxa, the femur, and the tibia, which is a servo each. And then we actuate it, we convert the, uh, uh, the side of the, the, the robot. So if it's the left side and the right side, there's actually a 100 degree difference, or 80 degree difference, so we need to convert it. And then it just returns the three strings together, that the single string containing the three servo con controls together. And that's more code. So we have this now, but testing the robot was kind of a dicey matter, so uh, we decided to build a uh, physics simulator. And uh, let me pass it on to Shipung now to talk about the simulator. Hello? Okay, it's working now. Uh, yeah, so one of the problems uh, we, we had when we were developing the hex board was it's not really convenient to test and develop on the real device because HexPod itself is kind of heavy and it's not easy to carry it around. And the battery gets drained pretty fast, so uh, we want to build a physics simulator so that we don't really need the uh, real device, so we can uh, just run the simulator on our laptop and uh, we can do development on the HexPod on it. So uh, we created this uh, HexPod same project. It is a physics simulator for HexPods. Uh, you can find the source code and instructions on how to run it uh, in this uh, GitHub repo. Uh, so first, uh, let me do a, show a demo video of how this uh, simulator works. Oops.
Uh, so you, you can send commands uh, through TCP port 5555. So I just do a telnet so we can send commands to it. Uh, so the commands we send to the simulator is uh, server controller commands, uh, like the dash one p something. So once you send the command, the uh, hex bar will move as the command says. So now we combine two commands together. So you can see uh, both of the legs are moving. And also you can drag the robot around to uh, see if anything is wrong. Uh, so here is a demo video for Hexbot theme. Uh, and I'll quickly go through how the simulator is built. Uh, so first, uh, we send commands uh, like this uh, through the TCP port. And then uh, we will use this command to update the bullet physics, uh, physics engine. And then we uh, update the positions and rotations of all the objects we have uh, in the uh, same uh, and render it with OpenGL so we can visualize the moments. Uh, sorry, the simulator is written in C++. Uh, so here uh, is, there are four items we need to uh, define for creating a new simulator. Uh, first, you need to define a world so you can add different objects in it to uh, create physics simulation. And then you need to uh, define shapes for each body part. And then you, you can bind these shapes with uh, rigid bodies. Uh, and because uh, each servos we have on the hex board is like a joint, so you need to create these uh, constraints uh, so you need to create a constraint for each joint so the legs are moving uh, correctly. Uh, here's the code for how to creating the shapes. Basically, the, uh, it's the, the body part is just the box and the legs part is uh, capsule shapes. And here is the code to uh, bind the shapes with uh, rigid bodies. And next is to add the constraints. So uh, this is uh, a leg of a uh, hex board. So it has three axes. So what we can do is uh, we can add hinge constraints here. Uh, basically, you just need to define uh, the uh, transformation matrix for the two bodies. And then you can add these kind of constraints. Uh, this is the code for adding the hinge constraints. And uh, now I'll pass it back to Saoxiang for all together. So now we have the, uh, we are able to control each one of the servos individually. We are also able to control the, each leg. But how do we actually make the robot walk and walk properly? So we model the um, hexapod against that of an insect, um, specifically of an, of an ant. So we wanted to see how an ant actually walks. So, um, by the way, I did not actually take this video of a, an ant walking. Like, uh, I got it somewhere from YouTube. So do you notice this is how the ants walks, and this is what is known as a tripod gait. So it has three legs moving at a time, and then it will say three legs first, and then the next three legs, and then the next three legs, and next three legs. So this is how it walks. This is a six-legged tripod gait. So a tripod gait for an ant is really not a running gait. It's actually just a walking gait. And that's good enough, I suppose, for, for what we wanted to do. So um, using this particular diagram, we built that uh, walking gate. And let me just show you the code. Uh, let me just show the actual code here. So including a, include a pod, um, initialize the legs, set the channels. And then as we move it, we set the tripod step one, tripod step two, tripod step three, step four. This is a little bit primitive. There are other mechanisms of actually moving the robot legs, and there are algorithms like the inverse kinematics. So we actually uh, use the simplest way possible. That's the most primitive way. But it works pretty OK. Um, not as smooth as it, it could have been, but it, move, it works pretty OK. So, so that's the hexapod code, let me just get back into the slides. And then 
Let me just show you how it all works together. Now with the code and the simulator, this is how it works. Added in Pry so that you can control the simulator directly. Um, you can see here now, I get into the simulator. I just say walk, and the robot walks. Right. Uh, and then if I say, I issue it a command, another command, say all the legs, I want to calibrate them. So it will calibrate the legs to moving to 90 degrees each. And then say something else, I want it to uh, tiptoe, so it would just stand up, right? So um, now we can control the, the simulator using the, uh, uh, the bots library. So this is, this is it. And actually, that's where we just stopped, um, because the whole duration we spent, I think, close to 90% of the time on the hardware. Like we went through a lot of iterations, a lot of problems. And the software, we spent just not as much time. So it has really just begun, uh, and we will be continuing after this. There are other things that we actually want to do. So previously, we were sending commands from the laptop to the robot to control it. But we're not giving up on the Raspberry Pi, because I think it's not autonomous until it, it can actually think on its own and move somewhere else. Um, it requires better servos. We bought the cheap servos, six bucks each, but there is a reason why uh, some of the other servos cost 40 bucks, right? Because they are better servos. And we wanted to put in sensors. Once it's autonomous, you can put in sensors, then you can detect the surroundings, and uh, it wouldn't walk smash into a wall. Uh, can maybe detect its environment and, and walk towards the light, or even do what uh, Jim did as to make it follow a particular uh, sensor or something. We want to try other different types of things. Uh, we want to try for bipeds, and we want to try for different kinds of materials as well. So as you we were doing the hardware and waiting for the new servos to come and so on, um, try different types of things, right? So uh, this is one I call Strider, the cardboard quadruped. So I built this with cardboard using a slightly different servo. And also, I built Cardbob. This is biped robot. <laughs> so this is a lot simpler. It's quite fun to build. So basically, what I did was I took some recycled cardboard and uh, I cut it up, and I built the foot and the tie, stringed them together, attached it to a body. Uh, this is the lower body, and then using the same principle, basically stick the servo controller on top and on the legs. And there's a video of Cardbomb. <laughs> so it's stumbling on, on uh, each other because my cardboard cutting skills are not exactly the best in the world. Um, but it works. And uh, so far, I think that's, that's, that's what we have today. Um, there are other robot libraries, and, such as Argus. This is the one that Jim did and R2 as well, um, which is actually an excellent library to control robots, and this is uh, something that I've tried as well. Uh, but before I go, I just wanted to show the real-life demo. If you can just turn on the lights, please. I hope this works. <laughs> I hate live demo. It's like, uh, it almost never works for me. It's too fast, okay. Oops, sorry. It's still showing the, sorry. Sorry. Uh, I need to change the code a bit. So this guy is using the simulator. I just need to make sure it goes to this guy. So let me run it again. Connecting with the robot, hopefully it works. Hopefully it doesn't fall off the edge.
Thank you. <laughs>